So hi everybody, um, it's uh, Nigel Guillaume here, the lead uh, GP training program director for St Mary's Scheme and uh, course director for Mentor MRC GP. I'm really, really happy to have um, Atar here with us. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Atar. An amazing score in your SEA, so huge congratulations on that. Um, you must be very happy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> really relieved. I got my <laughs> result last week and yeah, I, obviously I was very nervous like anyone else but i was surprised by my score as well because wow and it was it was a top score so 101 which is a, which is a huge score so thank you so much for joining us um before we kind of kick off with this uh this interview around the sca just do, do tell us a little bit about yourself your background where you are in terms of your training yeah um so i'm an st3 as well but i'm a sort of summer starter so i'm due to cct in uh in end of july right so I did do mine quite early. I know a majority of the people who did it this November were people who were due to CCT either this month or January or February. But I, I mean, I sort of had the get it out the way approach, but also, you know, I wanted a downhill latter half for my ST3. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, now, now, thankfully, I get to have it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, no, that, that sounds amazing. So you've got a great 2024 ahead of you, that's for sure. <laughs> without the worry of exams. So yeah. I thought it'd be really useful for our audience really to think about your approach to the SEA in the context of the three domains. And um, you very kindly sent me a snapshot of uh, uh, your marks, which I'm just gonna share with the with the audience. We can obviously see that you you really did very, very well. You know, 33 out of 36 in data gathering, clinical management was really solid as well. And then relating to others, 29 out of 36. So giving you an overall mark of 101 out of a 126 which is really very very impressive um if we maybe just break down i suppose your approach to each of these three domains perhaps you could give us a few top tips so um the data gathering i mean how what would what advice would you give to a trainee in terms of how to optimize marks in terms of data gathering i think i'm um, having a really clear battle plan with each case before you go in i mean you have the three minutes to read the sort of um patient information before which reading it takes about one minute and then two minutes sort of composing your thoughts and having a plan going forward you know there's different ways of data gathering and there's different um types of stations for example it could be following on from a colleague who saw a month ago with the result and you know a lot of people i feel especially people i practice with found this a bit difficult but um, and so did I. But what we came up with an approach where y you still need to show your data gathering marks, but you need to be sort of appropriate with it like you would in real life. You know, yeah. if someone's already had a consultation a month ago and they're here for a result. You're not going to go through and do what you would have done in that if they were first presenting. You know, you discuss the result, whether it's assuming it's normal and then sort of ask them how they've been since then. Mm -hmm. You know, ask a few other general symptoms and do a you know general systems review make sure they're safe make sure there's nothing new from what you know from the notes that you already have yeah and um you know having a having a really clear approach behind it i think what what one of my early downfalls was which i worked on was that not to be sort of symptom driven but yeah. be a bit more story driven and you know it, it's, it's it is reflective on real life you know we, we're never gonna we don't diagnose every 10 15 consultation we have we work them up appropriately. We get all the kind of, we, we risk assess them, go through red flags, you know, go through a brief systems review and give them a safety net plan. Yeah. I mean, I know that, uh, I guess, overlaps a little bit more into clinical management, but in terms of data gathering, it's just making sure they're safe, making sure the plan that you're going to go on to in the second half is the right plan for them. Yes. Yes. And I think that's really important, isn't it? Because we talk about our mantras on, on the course. Yeah. Uh, which, which you attended and specifically we have a follow-up mantra which is kind of knowing your place in the patient's journey so often that's quite clear from the notes you know what was the discussion with the last gp so rather than going over old ground i suppose the analogy is when you enter that journey we, we talk about it as a car journey you're coming into the driver's seat but you need to understand how you've got to that point and and so much of that information in terms of case priming will help you save time basically rather yeah. than seeing it as an undifferentiated case because it's not is it because i mean at the end of the day if you've got a result you kind of already know what the diagnosis is and then the key exactly. really is then to go back into the narrative to see as you say have things changed actually what does the diagnosis mean to the patient and ultimately mm. being reactive to not just the diagnosis but obviously their, their narrative and their story um in terms of i suppose cases where you weren't completely sure what was going on what would your approach be in terms of data gathering? Because there's always going to be a case where you're not clear what the diagnosis is. 
Yeah, and I guess one of the rubrics is diagnostic uncertainty. They make that really clear in one of the in the blueprint as well. And a lot of, you know, every day is diagnostic uncertainty. I think um, the best way I approach that is, again, sort of making sure there's no red flags. I always made that a priority. And bringing in ice quite early, yeah. I found it always helped me. It always helped me. I did that in most cases, if not every case, actually. Yeah. Um, even if it was relatively clear, you, you don't have to sort of phrase it like a robot, you know. Yeah already yeah. mentioned their concern but you still want to show that you're ice you, you know yeah. i sort of throw it back on them and say okay i know you've mentioned that you're worried about this is there anything else you're worried about and actually there are times they bring up new information yeah. and that helps you drive the uh, drive the yeah. data gathering in that direction yeah and i will say the patients or the sorry the actors were really good patients it, it, the script was clearly quite standardized and it was quite fair mm. they do sort of guide you when you show engagement and when you pick up on cues they help you a lot yeah, so I think picking up on cues is really important for this. Oh, exam. absolutely, and that's such a message we talk about on the course, which is the cue is king, queen of the consultation, and and because it's standardised, it works in your favour because you know that actually they're saying something, they're saying it for a reason to help mm. you, and they're the only people, obviously, that can help you in the exam. You know, they can try and guide you. So data gathering we've talked about in terms of case priming, opening up ice, using ice, listening to the cues. Let's move on to the the kind of clinical management section because we know now that this is weighted much heavier, one and a half times more heavy compared to uh, the other two domains of data gathering and relating to others. And, and this is where I think a lot of people have fallen down in, in, in the November sitting, um, mm. primarily because they spend too long data gathering and actually they don't necessarily understand what the clinical management section means. I mean, I suppose when we talk about clinical management, it isn't just about the clinical aspect, is it, in terms of management? No, absolutely, Nigel. I think, um, I, I, as you said, I think it, you treat it like a game of two halves. It doesn't mean exactly six minutes, stop your history taking yeah. on to the management, but but have an approach of a game of two halves. You know, half of it is the data gathering, the relating to others, which we'll talk about, goes on throughout. But the clinical management isn't managing a condition. It might be in one of the stations, but it mm. could be just what your next steps are. Yeah. And having the patient involved in that, and I found that really helpful and important. Obviously, I didn't score it as highly, but what I did do that helped me was, you know, okay, we'll bring you in for some blood tests. You know, you can go so much further in that and actually explain to them, you know, I want to check your blood, I want to check your blood count for anemia, for example, because that could contribute to a tiredness as well as vitamin D and doing mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. thing for blood sugars. Yeah. Um, you know, so involving them in that plan. Uh, one thing I think helped me as well was, you know, very clear safety netting as well, yeah. because again like in real life we, we we're at a point of their illness we don't know if this is something that will pass yeah if it's something that's going to be a new chronic diagnosis we, we don't know yeah and i think it's being confident in not knowing if that makes any sense you know yeah. we, we're not expected to diagnose i don't think i diagnose apart from if it was uh sort of um explaining a new diagnosis station mm. to someone i didn't diagnose in any station mm. i just sort of worked them up safely mm the stage they are mm. and following that kind of mantra and you know being safe and appropriate in that really helped yeah. me as well i think that's a very important point that actually what you're being assessed on is how you manage uncertainty with confidence yeah but i, I suppose the issue is also we need to make sure we're not over investigating not over referring so actually what's i think fundamentally important is being reactive to risk rather than being risk averse mm. so you know um i suppose in the context of the sca we don't want doctors who are defensive in their practice because actually that's not the same as being safe you know being safe is about recognizing firstly how you might be able to contain something if it's not serious but you know the flip side knowing how to risk escalate by recognizing what potentially is serious um mm. so i think that's that's a really really important point that actually we're, we're we need to be seen to be confident and i think what i've often seen is that if you're not particularly confident there is a tendency to to perhaps over investigate over examine and just say i can't make any sort of commitment until i've got my my kind of results back which which unfortunately doesn't quite cut it in in the clinical management section you've got to go a bit further with that absolutely so i mean i wish I, even in real life i could sort of advice and guidance every speciality yeah. in reality, that's obviously inappropriate and yeah. and as is in the case of the exam i think even saying discuss with my supervisor mm. that they're easy cop-outs and it's not wrong to do but i think um having confidence in where you are and their narrative, confidence in their story and confidence of your workup of how safe they are and how safe you can escalate the risk. Maybe it might be a two week wait and obviously explain that to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something you can follow up after blood tests. And yeah. you know, you 
explain that to them. It doesn't need more than that. Yeah, yeah. Reality, that's what it is. It's true. And and I think, you know, one one sort of key case which which can often throw people, especially in real life, is like rashes, for example. You know? yeah. I mean, it's it's quite rare to be able to say, you know, this is the exact diagnosis of this rash, but actually being able to say, you know, there have been no red flags here. This is a rash which I really feel we can contain without necessarily having to escalate it. Um, and as you say, having that safety netting and continuity uh, will be key because they talk about, you know, the use of time, you know, effectively. And that's not just in the consultation. It's it's, you know, in terms of, of the follow up and, and, and the safety net as well. So mm -hmm. I suppose moving on to the, the, the final um, domain of relating to others. I mean, what, what would your you know, key pieces of advice be here to, to maximize marks in, in this in this area? I think this is something that goes on for the 12 minutes and it's, you know, even things that seem really simple, but it's easy to forget, you know, showing the empathy, mm -hmm. um, you know, even even ice to an extent is sort of relating to them, uh, picking up on their cues, reacting to the cues, being empathetic to the cues and acting on it as well and moving on from it. And absolutely, absolutely showing no judgment. You know, they like to bring in a lot of different dilemmas and social issues. And, you know, instead of sort of going straight into, oh, you know, let me test your capacity yeah. and make sure that's that you can explore it further. You know, if they're worried about going somewhere or to a clinic, you know, do you mind me asking why? And there's usually yeah. a reason behind that. Yeah. You know, the people don't just not want to seek further healthcare for no reason. That's right. And exploring that, exploring that with them and sort of, you know, addressing that with them and explaining, you know, I understand it's difficult and try it's it's a negotiation as well, isn't it? And yeah. having good negotiation skills. I think how, really how 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 often did you have to negotiate in this exam? quite a fair bit and it, it it wasn't always a sort of negotiation or something needs an urgent review and they're refusing to go to hospital it could be even a mild negotiation where they want a bit more of a further treatment but they haven't done sort of earlier treatments yeah and you know they might not know that there are earlier treatments and explaining that to them you know asking if they know there's earlier steps that could help them with fewer side effects for example yeah. and a lot of times they don't know that and you know you go on to explain it to them and they're happy to sort of then uh, go ahead with your plan. Yeah. So I guess I'm hearing two themes, which is really how you acknowledge, I suppose, the emotive aspect or if someone's fearful or anxious. So we, we talk about this a lot, don't we? And, and I'm sure you'll be sick to death of this, but the acknowledge, empathize, energize, which. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really helped. It really it helped. Help. Take over half the stations I needed that approach. So anything that's emotive, anything where there's a patient anxiety or pushing a, a certain type of agenda, we need to firstly acknowledge it. And then I guess the second thing is to be patient centered is, is actually about working through, as you say, um, and finding a potentially a compromise. So that, that those kind of negotiations, because rather than just being driven by the patient to do what, what they want to happen, because obviously you're the driver of the consultation per se in this kind of assessment yeah um, so yeah. negotiation skills i think are absolutely key so I, I suppose just moving forwards for your for your peers and those that are listening in, in the audience who may have well been stung in the november sitting feeling quite low um those who are obviously getting really anxious about you know the sittings in in 2024 what would your kind of top tips be to how you would revise and, and strategize i think um practice Practice, practice makes perfect, but also doing the right kind of practice. You know, you could practice for three, four months, but doing the wrong approach, and then you'll sort of still be in the same position. I found small group practice virtually, because it is a virtual exam, was really effective for me. You know, I did use those sort of case books, and they are helpful just for example cases. But, you know, I can't stress this enough. This isn't a diagnostic exam. We're not aiming to see this is the diagnosis, or you have these symptoms and it matches this. This is, your, this is what I'm going to treat you with. Yeah. It's sort of, yes, being narrative driven, but as you say, also making it sort of doctor led as well and finding that right balance. And you can only do that with practice, time the 12 minutes and, um, you know, explore the symptoms, explore the story. It's not just symptom driven, it's narrative driven and finding the balance between both. Yeah. And dividing it in halves, you know, do your data gathering. It might go on for seven, eight minutes and then the management in terms of following up. And, you know, there's times even in the real exam, I forgot one or two really important questions when I was sort of one or two minutes later. And I, you know, you, you're, you're human. And I sort of yeah. said, oh, I'm really sorry. I forgot to ask this. Mm. This could change things. But do you mind if I check this, that yeah. and that? They were happy to answer. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. 
I think that's yeah. important, isn't it? Because actually we are only human and just being honest and transparent about it, especially if the, if the, if the question necessitates a response which might change the direction of travel, then you, you kind of have to ask it. I suppose the flip side is you don't want to crowbar in questions like smoking and alcohol if they've got nothing to do you know, with the case per se and it's not going to change what you, what you do because, I mean, that's very formulaic. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that I noticed in study groups, though, is that unfortunately people aren't as hawkish on that. So often, you know, we, we're almost in this routine of just asking these questions without actually thinking, well, what, what purpose has that got? Because it's not an OSCE. It's not like you get a tick for, for asking these questions. No, I completely agree. It's really easy to sort of to do it with your peers and sort of say, oh, you know, you showed good empathy, mm. you reacted to cues, you asked ice. But there's so much more to that. You know, I think the stations I did best in are the ones where there were times even with the patient, I was sort of laughing. Yeah. It felt so conversational and yeah. so natural. And, you know, treat it naturally. I think that's the best advice for on the day that I can give. Treat Really do treat it like real life because it is quite reflective on real life cases, I do admit. Yeah. Um, and with the practice sessions, you know, don't be scared of being critical of your peers and don't be scared to asking feedback. Even if it's just one point, that one point could get you those extra marks to get you over the line. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I think a lot of people are worried to be critical of others, but, you know, invite no, I think that's that's the issue, isn't it? And and obviously, I suppose my reputation and, and we've worked together, you know, for some time, you know, to really hone in your strategy is is you know, tough love is love all the same, isn't it? And and ultimately, it's it's all good and well to say to somebody, you're really nice, but you know, is that really going to help me pass the exam when actually what I really need to understand objectively are, are the behaviors that need to, to change strategically um, in order to pass yeah. the exam. So, um, so thank you very much. And thank you for accepting my tough love over the last few months. <laughs> um, well, it helped me. It helped me. So what can I say? Thank you. And um, it was really you, helpful that you. having that battle plan, having the mantras to follow it, you know, it related to every case that I did. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm really glad. It feels a bit like a family affair because obviously, um, you know, ha having helped uh, your sister through the RCA and now yourself through the SCA feels like the, the loop is complete. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be seeing like your cousin or somebody like that <laughs> in, in due course. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, it, is it, there's not another brother or sister coming through the... Oh, no, no, I'm the youngest. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm with us. You're done with us for now. Um, so finally, plans post CCT. I mean, 2024 going to be very exciting for you. What, what What's on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I have six months to just actually enjoy GP, learn about GP, even learn about the management side of general practice. You know, I have the time to do that now. Um, you know, 14 fish isn't exactly a strenuous task compared to revising for an exam. Yeah. So that's, that's fine in itself. Yeah. And then I'll see sort of, um, you know, I'll do what most people do short term, a few locums, maybe take up a part time salary post somewhere locally to me. And then um, we'll see. I like out vows as well. So I'll venture in a bit of that. And then Thanks. we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on. I'm sure our audience will find that your top tips very, very valuable. And I uh, wish you all the best of luck in 2024. And of course, a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And good luck, everyone, to watching this. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.